Good evening, and welcome to Visionary Women. I am Shelley Reed. <laughs> I'm the president of Visionary Women, and on behalf of our founders, our executive committee, and our visionary circle, we are so delighted to see each and every one of you here this evening. And it is a sold out event, as you can tell. So, For those of you who are new to Visionary Women, just want to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are a nonprofit organization. We have been programming salons like the one you're going to experience tonight uh, for two years, inspiring women, reaching out to the community, tapping into leadership. Our mission statement is to become the premier platform for dialogue on issues specific to women, issues that may be controversial, issues that may just not be adequately addressed in the cultural ethos, but our goal is to activate opportunity and leadership for young girls and women. And we hope to affect and effect change create opportunity, and if we're lucky, maybe even influence policy. And of course, and break the glass ceiling. <laughs> and of course, the most wonderful byproduct of all of this is this tremendous network of like-minded, smart, engaged, passionate women that have all gathered here, and it really is our sincere desire that you look at Visionary Women as your clubhouse, as the place that you come to and you meet like-minded women, you walk away inspired and hopefully with a new friend. Now, our goal is to make sure that we use our influence and our resources, and by doing that, we have been able to program events that last year were globally focused. And from that, we were able to take the proceeds that we earned and support a number of globally oriented initiatives. For example, the Sherry Blair Foundation for Women, a marvelous foundation that supports women in emerging markets, teaches them how to build businesses, particularly in Africa. We also were able to support Apne App International. I have to put my glasses on at this point, I apologize. World of Children and Communities in Schools, and Peace is Loud. Now, this year, our focus is a little more localized. Our first salon in October, Women in the Arts, allowed us to align ourselves with LACMA, and we have been able to provide a grant for a wonderful Ethiopian artist, one of the leading contemporary artists in the world right now, Julie Maratu, to support and endorse her solo exhibition at LACMA, which will be next year. And from the proceeds and revenue that we earn tonight, we have earmarked some wonderful ways to support women. We are making a contribution to the Sundance Institute's Women's Initiative that supports women who are storytellers and producers. We are also uh, supporting a high school campaign of a documentary film by the name of Audrey and Daisy, and only by coincidence did we know that it was picked up by Netflix. And we are hoping to really help a grassroots campaign. This is a story about two young girls who went out on a date. They were sexually assaulted. They then incur incurred some bullying, and then the consequence of that was it all being put up on social media, and it was really a tough story. And we really want to be able to have a conversation with teenagers and help that. And then finally, from tonight, we are going to support the Chrysalis Foundation Women's Empowerment Program. And the Chrysalis Foundation is a terrific organization, and they help homeless women get rebooted and restarted into the community. And if we have anything left over from anyone who might be inclined to make additional contributions, we will make sure that the, those funds are spent in the same manner. Now, at Visionary Women, we really want to 
lead by example. So you will find that at every salon, we make a point of inviting a group of young girls. And tonight we have 32 young ladies from a number of schools, Cal State Northridge, the Yes Foundation Scholarship Program, and Step Up. And we would like to ask these young ladies to please stand so we can welcome them. And don't be shy. Welcome. Now, bef and some over here. Now, before we start our program, we have a young lady that we would like to introduce you to. Her name is Natalie Shalar. Natalie is a junior at Cal State Northridge. She is studying marketing with a minor in finance, and she has been part of Visionary Women, and she has something to tell you about Visionary Women. Natalie? Thank you, Shelley. And again, my name is Natalie Snolly, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how I joined Visionary Woman and how it's impacted my life. About a year ago, I got a call from a man named Bob Sheridan, and he said, hey, are you interested in working for Angela Nazarian? And I said, of course. Why would you even ask that? But what I didn't know was how much it was going to impact my life. To me, Visionary Woman is not just a nonprofit. It's just not a time where we congregate on a Thursday to talk about important prevailing issues pertaining to women. Being a Visionary Woman is a lifestyle. It is a movement, and it is a choice. I hope that you guys take the time to really listen to the words that are being spoken today, and also notice that we have a lot of very successful people in the house, and also a lot of high school students and college students who are interested in being mentored. So I, take the, I hope you guys take the chance to get to know these high school students and these college students, ask them what are their passions and their dreams, and hopefully they can be just like you. Thank you. That's, thank you so much, Natalie. That's really, really tells it all. Inspiring, touching. So I would like to introduce our founders and our executive committee, if I may, Angela Nazarian, Lily Bossi, Nicole Avant, Veronica Grazier, would you please stand? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Brain Trust. And I'd also like to introduce everyone to our Visionary Circle members. You know who you are. Would you please stand so everyone can see you? Smart, smart, wonderful women. And we would like to thank all of those in the audience who have acted as mentors and those who have sponsored the young students to be able to attend this evening. We also would like to thank Popcorn Chardonnay for providing the wine, and we apologize that we kept you waiting a tad. And finally, we really do want to uh, say thank you to our sponsor, Cartier. They have been just incredible. They are so aligned with us in our vision. The Cartier Foundation has many wonderful initiatives supporting women, and they have been so generous with the little gifts that they've left for you. So thank you very much to Cartier for any of the people that might be in the room. We truly appreciate it. So tonight, the program is bringing men into the conversation. <laughs> and we have with us two incredible guests tonight. Ted Sarandis, Chief Content Officer of Netflix. And that's, for those of you who are not in the television business, that's House of Cards, The Orange is New Black, The Crown. And we have, as our second panelist, Brian Grazer, the prolific, <laughs> prolific Academy Award winning and Golden Globe winning producer and co-founder of Imagine Entertainment. And he has produced everything from a beautiful mind to empire. And, and by the way, both Brian and Ted have been listed at different times in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. Pretty incredible. 
both Brian and Ted are at the top of their game in a very competitive industry. And both Brian and Ted are thought leaders in the most influential form of communication today, which is television. And both Brian and Ted, in their respective fields, are deemed to be innovators of the highest order. And they are both socially conscious, and they are both aware, and they're unique in that they truly appreciate and understand the influence they have in portraying the perception of women in the media. And for that, we're very, very grateful. <laughs> Ted Sarandos and Brian Grazer. Hi. I think you want to pull this. We're restaging this right now. Okay. Whoa. Okay. This is Brian and this is Ted. <laughs> We had the okay, visuals sorry. to give us a little more confidence for the room, I think, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be nobody. Um, Ted, what, uh, hey. what, are we starting this up? We'll jump right in. I, I was going to say, but my observation was, if there's any question about uh, po women in power in Hollywood, um, when, our, when our wives asked us to do, us to do this, we said yes, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> no delay, <laughs> no negotiation. <laughs> I know. And by the way, it's probably the most nervous we've ever been at any speaking event because of that. They're both sitting there like, get going, <laughs> get cracking. All right, so, um, are we, is that signaling? What? Yeah. No. Was that my thing not working? Yeah. Oh. There we go. Uh, tech guy, none of the tech works for me. So Ted, which project are you the most excited about? What are you the most excited about working on right well, now? You, the Seems that, like a good starter, doesn't it? We'll break the ice with that. <laughs> So you okay. saw the, the few minutes of The Crown in there right now. Yeah. We, we launched The Crown about uh, three weeks ago, and it's been <laughs> remarkable. Uh, we're, we're in production right now on the second season, uh, and this is going to take uh, the life of Queen Elizabeth from age 29, uh, presumably, to current day. Um, and we'll see it lay out, play out over decades, uh, both the relationship with her family, with her husband, uh, with her, uh, with certainly her relationship with the crown is the thing that's most interesting. And I think we've seen a lot of things on Queen Elizabeth, but um, we've already learned so much more about her than we ever have by watching the first 10 hours. Uh, and certainly about how you wrestle with this, how can you be both uh, leader and monarch and queen and sister and daughter and granddaughter and mother. Uh, and it's just a, a constant struggle that uh, it's really never been explored before. So that's what's got me really excited these days. What part of the perspective of that were you the most attracted to? Um, well, I mean, what turned you on to it? It came in, it was really a crazy like, um, idea to come in with a, with a, a 60 hour pitch. Uh, we're gonna, the idea was that to do this over six decades, over six seasons, presumably uh, in about eight to 10 years to actually make the whole show. Um, uh, the cast that was already contemplated was phenomenal with Claire Foy playing the queen. Um, and Matt Smith, who was really popular. We, the, the thing that people don't get, he, he's hugely popular from Doctor Who. So right. sci-fi fans all over the world love to see this. And so when that show came out, it popped around him right away. Uh, John Lithgow's performance as, as, as Winston Churchill is one of the... That's amazing. One for the ages. Yeah. Uh, so when, when we met, I asked him, um, is there any part that he couldn't play? Because he's this great character actor. And he said, the only thing I can't play is short. <laughs> and it turns out Winston Churchill is one of the most famously short people he's ever played. So we had to do some cool things, like they had to make the doorways taller and all these kind of things to kind of manipulate his appearance a little bit. But his, wow. his performance is insane. Um, and, and it's just, and uh, Vanessa Bayer plays Princess Margaret. I mean, it's a really, what I was attracted to was a lot of new faces who were accomplished, but new to the most places in the world. And right. Peter Morgan wrote every word of every script. Um, and he has this intimate relationship with storytelling about the Queen already. Uh, having done The Crown and the Broadway show The Audience, and Stephen Daldry, the great director, was directing it, and it just felt like the perfect, if that show was going to work, it was going to work in that form. And then do you think about, when you, when you make such a big commitment like that, do you think about who the audience is, or do you, I mean, your company is known for having all the data in the world. 
You know what was great about when we were doing, when we were thinking So tell us every secret. Tell all the secrets. That's all the what numbers. I want. I mean, Let's look, I, you give gave me numbers. some questions, but I want to really know all the secrets of Netflix. I mean, first of all, let me digress for a quick second. Yeah. <laughs> I have been a movie and television producer for 30 years, and only recently has something called Netflix been created and pioneered by Ted and his uh, partner. And it's just been the most amazing thing possible because it's expanded tremendous opportunity for artists to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. And it's changed the shape and form of the way content is ingested. And it's, it's a remarkable company that you've, you've uh, pioneered. Well, thank you for saying I, it. I think it's, um, it's interesting. I think people ask me a lot, of, a lot of times, like, how did you do this? How did you do that? And a lot of it was ignorance is bliss. Like it, the reason we made a big, like our biggest bet out of, right out of the gate with House of Cards um, was uh, maybe because we didn't know any better. <laughs> I mean, we made a commitment to that show to, to do 26 episodes, two seasons, without a pilot, um, based on the material that we had, which was three great scripts and an amazing team. Robin Wright, Kevin Spacey, David Fincher, uh, Bo Willimon, who wrote those, those scripts, was nominated for an Oscar that year. It just seemed foolproof. Uh, yeah. So like an idiot, I go in and offer them two seasons right off the bat. <laughs> but the truth of it is, I think that I, there was no reason for them to say yes to us. We had, I mean, we had never launched a show. We'd never had done a, anything of our own. Uh, we've only licensed TV from other people and movies from other people. So, uh, and the show was so perfect, I thought, cer certainly someone, HBO, FX, AMC, someone's going to snap this up. So with a thousand reasons to say no, I had, we had to come up with one reason to say yes. And one was... You, you get 26 episodes without, a, without any notes, without any pilot. And they just, that was the, the proverbial right. offer you can't refuse. <laughs> and the only yeah, thing. Yeah, artists love that. Oh, they love that. <laughs> um, the or you just go, yeah, go ahead and do it. <laughs> I, you approve of the foundation of what it's going to be artistically, and then you just say, let them go. But you know what was great about it? We had no, I had no infrastructure to develop with them. We had no infrastructure to give them notes anyway. So it's like, it, it seems like it was so old. It was actually very right. practical. <laughs> um, but the, the, one, the one thing I did say, though, is to David, I said, you know, you can do whatever you want, but you have to put your name on it. And the bet was right. that he would have so much pride in his <laughs> brand that he would not do 26 hours of schlock. He was incapable of it. Turned into so, a good bet. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah well. So you, you <laughs> must have made bets that now look back on as insane that turned out wonderfully, too. So. Yeah, I mean, well, for, for me, I mean, my career started making a movie about a mermaid, so <laughs> it's completely illogical. Um, so, um, you know, basically, because I made a movie about a mermaid, <laughs> um, a man falling in love with a mermaid called Splashed with Tom Hanks. Um, oh, thank you. So I, I had literally hundreds of people over, executives over the, course of about six years say no to me on this particular project. It was just endless, and it was just like, and it was always a no with an insult on top of it. <laughs> like, you're, that's the stupidest idea. And I, and I would even go like, you don't have to tell me, don't, don't tell me why you're not doing it. But they felt compelled to tell me. Um, so because the movie worked and it was really, it seemed illogical, it was a fantasy, it broke a lot of rules, and it it might not have made sense, conventional sense. I've, I've never really applied any, uh, I never prognosticate kind of any creative decisions that I make. I don't ever think, well, what is an audience going to want? Why will they want it? I don't go through that sort of uh, projection of what people will want. I just right. kind of do it based on sort of informed intuition. Right. And, uh, but it's an endless process, of course. So what, now, in hindsight, what did you see in that story or in Tom Hanks? that no one else saw? Um, well, a couple of things <laughs> what I, that, I, that I saw. Well, one was, ultimately, the movie was about a, it dealt with a universal theme, which was about love. So when you stripped off the mermaid, actually, because I, I actually wrote the first couple of drafts of this script uh, because I was desperate. I had nothing. No, I had no money, I had no resources. So I thought, well, how am I going to create value for myself in Hollywood? And I thought the way to do that is to manufacture ideas and to the extent I can write them, even if, they're, you know, even if, they're, even if the treatment of what I'm writing is quite rudimentary. And so basically, I was just, maybe this is relevant. <laughs> so I'd, five years before Splash, I, I was 25 years old, and I produced some movies for TV that were pretty highly rated. Then I 
all of a sudden had an opportunity to date a lot of girls because I was a producer at 25. <laughs> Which is really interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Here in Hollywood. But I did that, <laughs> and at this particular gathering. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so given I had all these options and opportunities, um, I thought, wait My a second. My life at 25 was way more dull. Like, yeah, I <laughs> promise you. Where promise were you? Yeah. Arizona. Arizona. College. College. Yeah, no, okay. Keep going, keep going. So yeah. in any event, um, I thought to myself, well, this isn't, now that I have all this opportunity, it, it wasn't as interesting as what the fantasy of it was or the intrigue. And I thought, well, how would I find like the perfect girl for me here in Los Angeles. You know, it didn't seem like that was possible. And um, so I started to, <laughs> well, except till now, <laughs> I see, wow, I see all the possible. Yeah. Veronica Smiley Grazer <laughs> on the board. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I just started, I just started, what I did is I just sort of assaulted my own sort of truth and what, 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 what really interested me in life and what, what could potentially be my perfect girl. I started to write the definition of that, superimposed this mythological creature on top of it, which is a mermaid, and, but, it was, but it was really based in a sense of, it was really based in kind of practical logic. And so I guess what I learned is to, um, Understand the inner dynamics of how people interrelate yeah. and what they want and what they care about, what they fear and what they're confident. All those different dynamics are the most important dynamics and everything else is sort of an exterior, can be the exterior story yeah. of what something is. And your rejection story is really common. I mean, it is. I think everything that happens in Hollywood, television and movies, starts from some piece of conventional wisdom that everyone has betting on over and over and over right. again. What doesn't work, what doesn't work, what doesn't work. And like for us, the, the crown, as an example, was not a story about Queen Elizabeth. It was a story about a woman. It was a story about a mother, a story about hugely relatable, right? right. Which, is, which you wouldn't think at all, nothing could be relatable about your life and that of Queen Elizabeth. Right. But it turns out everything about her life is incredibly relatable. And House of Cards, the big conventional wisdom was nobody's going to care about shows about set in Washington, D.C. politics. And and, I, and, what we, and and prior to they do now. Well, there was a yeah. Now that's all we talk about. But prior to that, you had um, West Wing, which was years before, and that, and that, not another at bat sense. And I think what it was was I said, no, this is not a show about Washington D.C. politics. It's a show. It's Shakespeare. It's, Shakespeare. Yeah. it's about greed and power and sex and and all the things that are very very universal. And so this show works out not just in the U.S. but it plays all over the world like that. Wow. So it's that it's that, that kind of. Bucking conventional wisdom is... Well, wh what are the dynamics of Orange is the New Black? <laughs> um, well, fan, you any fans? So any fans of the show? <laughs> they, uh, a lot of, well, you have so many shows that, uh, the, that are... Yeah. Well, the one thing was is um, that is funny. The thing we always talk about is that we don't develop things. We usually try to go right to series and people come in. And this was our second project, and it was completely developed because it came to... Uh, Gingy Cohen had come in with this pitch which was based on a book that was fairly successful uh, about, uh, um, everyone knows what the show's about, but the idea was that she wanted to make the show about a woman's prison uh, that, again, conventional wisdom was these prison shows don't work. Uh, they're confined, so you know, you, they don't get, they're not broad enough, people don't get, a, you know, there's no change in scenery, uh, that uh, the people in prison are usually not very likable, uh, which is probably true. Um, so, but she had this great take on it, which was, no, this are, these are women, and this is a minimum securities prison, and the, the majority of the population of women in these prisons are typically victims, uh, women who were in the wrong place at the wrong time or with the wrong person at the wrong time, and, that, uh, and therefore they actually you know, are quite redeemable, and that uh, the way to solve the problem of it being confined is every episode we're going to deep dive into each of these people's lives. So we're going to get out of the prison, we're going to jump time, and, uh, and because of that, at the end of the season, you're going to know these characters better than any characters on television. It was such a great pitch. And Gingy had been so successful for, on Weeds prior to that. And we had licensed Weeds from Showtime, so we knew it played you know, really well. And we just took a flyer with her. And she went off and developed the And show. do you take flyers with people that, well, first of all, I think you do things pretty intuitively and you do them quickly. So yeah. how do you? 
how do you know to do that? Are you looking for like the original, an original voice that is supported by a tremendous amount of confidence? Do you do you do that based on a body of? Well, how do you make it's, those kinds well, of really big, fast decisions? The quick decisions, honestly, is just is a survival skill. Just because we are doing so much, so much, that mm -hmm. dragging things out they start piling up on top of one another. So I feel much better about a, a fast no than I do about a belabored yes. <laughs> and so, but, but really, the, I think coming in when people come in, and I'm teased about this a little bit in the office, but I love the pitches. I love the stories. I, I want them all to be great. Like I, when right. they come in, uh, it's their storytelling, and I, want, I love storytelling, so I want... So I want them all to work when they come right. in. And everyone always, they, they would. You want to see their better self. You, yeah, I mean, you, I look, so. you frame it to see their better I self. Have, I have a thing, and maybe it's a disorder, but I, if, <laughs> if I'm watching a movie. I don't think it is. <laughs> I, but if I'm watching a movie or a TV show, even if it's really bad, I ask Nicole, I don't turn it off. Like I don't ever walk out. I don't never. I don't think I've, I've never walked out of a movie, and I don't think I know. I've not turned off very many of them. And I honestly, I'm waiting for the good part. <laughs> and and wow. I know there's something good coming, you know. That's so really, that's and I cool. think the idea is that most people in town spend their whole day figuring out how to say no, and I try to figure out how do we say yes, and 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 I have other voices at the table to try to come in and say no. Here's why we have to say no, and there are times you have to say no, but but the opportunity. Um, uh, to say yes is so much greater than the power of no. Yeah, which is, no, it's very cool of you, and you're very, very unique. And I it's also like this I stole from my wife because, <laughs> I mean, because she, she, honestly, she, she had seen this play out over and over again in her time as an ambassador working with, in government, where government's all about no. And, uh -huh. I, and she would point it out to me every time it played out. I said, oh, my God. So, that, so I, I, I was able to see it now uh, in life because I saw it with her. Beautiful. Yeah. That's cool. Oh. <laughs> that's, not, that's great. Um, <laughs> honey, what, what should I say about you? <laughs> She's really positive. Yes. Every time I, yeah. <laughs> um, do you go through period, now you've, Netflix is, has existed for eight years? You no, we've been. No, I, I've been. I've been. I joined. Netflix. Oh, you've been doing it for eight years. No, no, we did. I joined oh. Netflix in March of 2000, going on 17 years. Oh, 17 years. Um, a lot of people didn't even know Netflix is around that long. But uh, we, when I started, we were mailing DVDs only oh, in the U.S. No wow. streaming, no digital, and I was the only LA employee. Every day, everyone else was in Silicon Valley, wow. and the cup we couldn't afford it, so I had my office was in my bedroom. And for two years, Jeez. and the whole and at that time we were just by basically buying DVDs, and my whole existence at the beginning was to developing direct relationships with the studios to buy DVDs. Um, but the vision of the company, I met Reed in late 1999, and the vision of the company was always Netflix, exactly like you see it right now. And he described this to me in 1999, and I mm. thought he was on crack because <laughs> the this was at a time, literally at that time, the very first mm. internet transaction I ever had was buying the airline ticket to go meet Reed. <laughs> and, and when he talked wow. about this idea that people are going to watch television or movies on, from the internet, that week someone had emailed me a clip from South Park. It took me seven days to open it. And, and I, so I, the whole thing just seemed so abstract to me. But the whole idea was he said, no, no, there's a thing called Moore's Law, and, which so, means the internet's going to get twice as fast and half the price every 18 months. And I just nodding like, anyway, oh, Moore's Law, yeah, yeah, Moore's Law. <laughs> and you just immediate, it. <laughs> immediately went home, f figure out something about Moore's Law. Uh, but, but it was like, but I really, in that case, was the bet, I mean, because this was after kind of the initial internet bubble burst, and this was not like a, the I IPO was not part of the package coming in. Uh, but what I really was betting on was this is such a revolutionary idea, and Reed's kind of incredible clarity about it. You know, like, uh, I'm always reminded, I told Reed he's like the beautiful mind, but without all the crazy. Because it's, cause he really has this sense of clarity and juggling right. complex ideas. It's incredible to watch. Yeah. And he, um, and in that case, I, I remember coming home thinking, that's a crazy idea, but I bet he's going to do something that's going to change the world, and I want to be close to it. Really? And, and I jumped into it, um, you know, with very little uh, hope, that, with no idea Netflix would be what it is today. Um, because what, what, everything he talked about You can about definitely was, get plane tickets today. Now I'm okay. Now we're okay. <laughs> but, the, but the idea that was that um, we would build the business on today's technology uh -huh. using the post office to deliver the bits for now because uh -huh. that's the cheapest way to move a lot of bits across country. 
and then eventually it would be so cheap to stream, and or that that word didn't really even exist then. It was just downloading at the time, mm -hmm. and it was before YouTube and all those things. And we set about to build a big business by mailing DVDs, which gave us real expertise in managing credit card relationships and marketing expertise and how to you know deal with these direct to consumer relationships. And then more importantly was again an observation from that 1999 conversation. Um, at the time, movie theaters were debating heavily about digital distribution, like um, fighting about who was going to pay for it, the studios mm -hmm. or the theaters. And we were talking about it, and he said, if, did, if the, the cheapest part of the P&L, the studio, is mailing prints around. So <laughs> that's why everyone's fighting about who's going to pay for it. It's not that important. What's important is marketing. If you could build a better mousetrap for marketing, you could change the P&L of the entire entertainment industry. Hmm. So get it by being able to target people efficiently by just using their taste, that you could really change the world. Hmm. And that was a huge breakthrough idea. Uh, and, I, and I thought about it later. I was like, well, you know, if you, like, if you live in Arizona, if you're Arizona and you like a movie that's this far outside of the mainstream in, 1990, or in 1980s when I was, took my first job in a video store, <laughs> um, you had no choice. There was no option. John Sayles, Spike Lee, these people didn't exist in Arizona. <laughs> the movies never showed up there. So, that, right. so, that, so this, then the video stores come along and it's like, wow, here's the big break. And then the same thing happens. The studios squeeze all the shelf space off for the 150th copy of the sequels of something. <laughs> and the same thing would kind of happen over and over again. And it's because the, it's so inefficient to market to small niches. And the internet enables you to really uh, capture um, addressable niches. Yeah. And if you have a global footprint like Netflix does, those little niches are big businesses because you get hmm. enough people in every little part, nook and cranny of the world, you can produce for them all. Uh, hmm. It's because the footprint's big enough. So it's all those things were just like, uh, which drove the success of the company. I think had very little to do with some of the stuff we're doing creatively. Mm -hmm. And then, be, then we had this infrastructure, then we could create for it. Mm -hmm. So one was like baking the cake and now we get to ice it, you know? Mm -hmm. Amazing, uh, yeah. amazing story. Um, just, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> do you, in your, do your, uh, of your customer base, are there, what is the appetite now? Is the appetite for, since we're with women this evening, visionary yes. women, um, <laughs> are there, is there a greater appetite for, with women to have women protagonists in shows? Or how do you, how do yeah. you analyze all that? How does it influence your buying? How does it influence your taste? It, 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 what happens, I think, when you look at, when you could take a, a look at data, just raw data, throw everything else out, then you get rid of all those conventional wisdom things we talked about, and it, uh, and it, which a lot of conventional wisdom goes into casting and goes into storytelling and who gets to tell stories. And what we see over and over again, you see a character like, like Claire Underwood, um, that, that women can carry a show enorm with, with enormous regularity. Uh, people want to see, people want television to look like them. They want television to look like the world. They, I think the business is better when television re re is built on reality, mm -hmm. which is I, I relate to those people. They look like me. They sound like me. I know exactly who that person is. I've, that, that was my college roommate. I know who that <laughs> person. Um, and, and so, that, so if, we, if, we, if you take all those constraints off of saying, mm -hmm. You know, we have to do it this way because their stakes are so high, mm -hmm. then you could try things and get out of the comfort zone a little bit. And, mm -hmm. you know, between Jessica Jones and Orange is the New Black, and I mean, we have, I mean, we, people, talk, Netflix is like the home of kick ass women. Those characters yeah. are, um, do, or defy any kind of normal television uh, casting, or certainly any writing for television. Do you, um, do you feel like you know this, when, when you think of, the, the, like the lead in a television series, or even a movie for that matter, do you think you understand a, women's, a woman's psyche as well as you understand a man's psyche? I, I don't think I do personally, and my wife will attest to that. Um, but I, what do you, come on, say something. But, I, but I, do, I, I do think it's like one of those things where you're, it's, it's, not, it's the predisposition to trust the storytellers, and that you understand when someone comes in and tells a story that's a very personal story particularly, that they get that point of view much better than I do and give them rain and give them room to, to explore the characters. Yeah. So I do think that, um, uh, I don't know that there's, again, I don't, it goes back to that other thing, which is when you want to say yes instead of no, you're, you're more likely to take chances on people and they rarely disappoint you. They really, right. I mean, it, it, it's not without you know, some disappointment, but in that case, I think when someone comes in and tells you their story, there's such an arrogance to saying, I know why that won't work. You know what I mean? 
Right. And I think the ability to say, no, you know, that I think there's something there and give them the space to keep digging for it. Right. Yeah. Like conventional television networks, do you have things you need and things you don't need? You know, like if you, any network, networks as you know, they sort of have a matrix of what they need, what they don't need, and it, it sort of plays to what they're programming in that we, time. You know, we try because a, a typical network, um, any of you, any, any, Viewer probably spends, NBC. NBC. The average viewer probably spends a few minutes a day on NBC. Yeah. Uh, and, really? And our our average Netflix subscriber spends two hours a day watching Netflix. Average. Jeez. So that's what's happening. And what happens is you've got all these people Full different thing. with incredibly. No diverse wonder you were asked to speak today. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got all these people with incredibly diverse taste. Incredibly. Can we diverse. get a show on Netflix? <laughs> you might. Too? Yeah. I mean, the we two of us together. <laughs> This show. Wait, this show. Uh, I mean, come on. But remember, people's tastes are yes. so wildly diverse. We do try to we do try to get something, but in the in the spirit of trying to get something for everyone. Yes. So like we went uh, recently, we did um, Grace and Frankie is going into its new season. Um, thank you. But that's a, there's an example though. Netflix, like all other internet companies, mm -hmm. starts off pretty male, uh -huh. pretty young, pretty white. And as we get bigger and bigger, we are, we start to look more like the world too. Um, so Grace and Frankie was a demographic that we were not addressing, uh, and we tried to you know be able to broaden our customer base by broadening our storytelling base. So we did with Grace and Frankie, we did for Longmire, uh, we brought in a lot of more project. In fact, we just finished production on a film, a love story between Robert Redford and Jane Fonda called Our Souls at Night. Uh, that would be people like them or actually them. The, them. No, them. I know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's um, but it's cool. based on a really beautiful book, and it's the kind of movie, as you know, yeah. that'd be very difficult to get made today. A love very, story with yes, yeah, yeah. you know people in their late seventies. Yeah. Um, but it, but it's a really a beautiful film, and I'm so proud that we'll be able to do it. Wow. So being yeah. able to do this because our shows don't have to work in a time slot. Yeah. That's what gives us a lot more freedom and flexibility. When people are programming a network and they go, oh my God, this show has to work on Wednesday at 8 and I have to put the perfect show in front of it and the perfect show behind it or none of this works, yeah. I have, I'm free of that part. So yeah. our shows just have to work eventually. Right. And, <laughs> and, and then when you give shows room to breathe. Well, it's very liberating, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You give shows room to breathe, they pay off. People they, find them, they discover them. Yeah. Have you ever, I mean, I've done this a few times in movies or television where I have a movie that has a male protagonist and then I say, I'm not, I'm going to change it and I'm going to make it a woman. And I've done this many times and also in television shows where I said, where there's a great character that's written and I think, I think I'll do this as a woman. Uh, have you ever do that? Well, just recently, I, I can't say the show right now, but we... Um, we were casting, we were down to you the last. You can't say the show. I can't yet. That's a secret. But we were casting, and it was the last part to be cast, and the last two yeah. candidates for the role, one was male, one was female. And we were completely open to whichever, wow. whoever had the best audition. So. Well, you can, well, I'll you tell can't, you that story another time. Okay, tell yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Part two. But that had to be, what's, what's the, when you, when you did the flop, what's, will we know the film? The, the movie that I've done that That you with? did the flop, where you flopped. Oh, then I flipped it. Oh, yeah. well, one was Flight Plan. It was a guy. Yeah. And then I made it Jodie Foster. Bravo. Oh, no. But I had to go through a huge fight with the chairman of the studio that was almost endless. And um, just eventually, I just hired her anyway. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm she, great at she, She's fantastic. But I just, I like to see, I mean, look, it's, I'm playing to the right group here, but I love seeing and doing women in power. Um, I've done, like, I like doing Blue Crush. Everyone said you gotta do a guy surf movie. I didn't wanna do a guy surf movie and it turned into being like kind of a movement. Yeah. Um, but I, I do really enjoy that. And of course I like uh, Cookie in, in our show Empire. I, I think maybe Francie is here and Eileen Chaikin who's the exec producer of the show. Oh, she is, Noel, someone's here. Okay, yeah. there we go, okay. Francie's here, so. Um, I, I just no, and I also love, by the way, what Shonda Rhimes does, which is unbelievable. Yeah. Where she, Bravo. She, uh, I, because I feel like I understand a male psyche pretty well, and so I'm able to apply that to movies that I've done before. And I, I, because I think that men, I don't even know if this. I'll test it on you. <laughs> <laughs> with with men, a lot of the movies that I've made are about men that have drive and they're driven towards something that we feel is noble but there's an emotional injury embedded in them, yeah. and they have to overcome that emotional injury to get 
to the end of this movie. Like, in, but for example, like in Friday Night Lights, they don't win the game, but they get over their emotional injuries. Or in Eight Mile, he, of course, he does these rap battles, but it's not really even about rap or rap battles. It's about a guy that's able to actually complete his full identity by having the having the courage to actually look at the audience yeah. and be a complete person and to liberate himself by, at the very end of the movie by saying, yeah, I am white trash, yeah, you did, you did fuck my girlfriend, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, but that was really empowering to him and that's ultimately what the movie's about. With women, I don't really know what those I don't even know how that plays out, actually. So I kind of, so I, so, so I actually try to start women more like what Shonda does. I, they, I start them sort of at the top already with power, and then they still have a goal or something to do that's within the story. But they've already, they already are beginning at a place of power because I don't yeah. really think that I fully understand now. In the case of finding the great writer that does it, then of course I'll abdicate that kind of judgment to say, go figure that out for me. But uh, Tell me about your, your mentor when you started in Hollywood. Well, um, your first mentor was a, was a woman. I did. My first, my first mentor was a woman. Her name was Deanne Barkley. And um, she sensitized me to uh, the, the sixth sense that a woman has, that superpower that, <laughs> is, that is pretty profound. But her, um, I was... 24 years old, and I pitched, I was, I, I really had kind of, I wasn't, what would you say you were doing, working in a video store? Yeah, I was working in a video store. I wasn't store quite working in a video store, I was doing something equally as demeaning. <laughs> 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 I mean, for sure, I, I'm telling you for sure. So, but I was, eventually I was writing sort of registered letters to myself, registered mail letters to myself with ideas that I could hope to sell, and I was in my first most important television pitch at NBC, and, the, and this woman named Deanne Barkley was probably the most per important person in all of the movie and television business, and there might have been only three powerful women in the entertainment business, and Deanne was probably on the very top of it. And she was from uh, New Orleans, and she had a very New Orleans-style office, and she had a birdcage in the office, way far away from where we're, I was pitching. And I had her very interested in this thing that I was pitching. I pitched her two projects. And all of a sudden, during the pitch, we hear a thump. <laughs> and then a second thump. These two birds just died right in the office. <laughs> and they just, and she, I didn't know what she was going to do. I thought, I literally thought she was going to start crying or something. It'd be like the worst meeting. But she started to laugh hysterically. <laughs> I don't know why, but she did, and uh, maybe she, she was smoking pot all day long. <laughs> but she was gigantically the successful. The I don't know, but the birds died. She um, <laughs> laughed, and she said she thought this was like kismet. This was a moment or something, yeah. sort of serendipitous. And she said, I'm buying both these projects. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, she, she, she bought them both, and I was able to barter them with actually ultimately with Warner Brothers so that I could create a little deal for myself, a foundation, or like a base for myself with these two series. Wow. And she became my mentor and closest friend. And, um, and I was like, while I was trying to propel myself even beyond that, she would say, well, meet so-and-so, meet someone, and I would meet these different people. And um, they were very powerful. They were icons in the movie and television yeah. business. And I said to her, I was very anxious about saying this because I was revealing. So I said, I'm, I just met so and so. I just met. And the first half hour was amazing. And then something happened where they're not calling me back. And she said, You want to know? I said, Yeah. She said, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess. Do you want? Uh, she said, I think you might exaggerate things a little bit. <laughs> so, I, so I said, you mean you think I'm like, like lying about stuff? So she said, very likely. <laughs> so she just was able to tell me. Very delicate advice. She was, very, she, was very able, she was able to tell me this thing, this piece of advice that was like penetrating, but it was, I applied it almost immediately because basically, from that moment on, instead of exaggerating, because I would, I'd say, if, if somebody liked an idea of mine, I'd, say, I'd be telling people I'm shooting it. <laughs> so I think that's where she got that. But, 
So I immediately sort of cut it down to like, I would say if I was actually, if in fact I was ready to shoot a movie and it's like the day of, and someone said, are you making, are you making night shift? I'd say, I'm not sure. I just would like, I low played it all the way, all the way, all the way down. Yeah. And it turned out to be kind of a great tool because in the world of complete hyperbole, which is kind of this universe that we live yeah. in, it, it has, you, it, you immediately start to have real credibility. I also, there was a byproduct of that. I actually sort of created the story of Liar Liar based on that. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, because it's just the mechanism of like, what if a person had lived in a world of lies and in one day they couldn't lie at all and just like all those spinning plates would crash. Yeah. And so it became sort of a very, it be, she be, that piece of advice became the most useful advice I'd had ever. And she was a gigantic, you know, friend and mentor to me. It, it funny, you'd think that the two dead birds with their feet up would be your logo for your <laughs> company know. right now. I, mean, I, <laughs> I know, you'd think. <laughs> it's not a bad idea for my next company. <laughs> your next company. Um, What's that? It's ours. Oh, <laughs> oh whoa. <laughs> All right, so do you think so we should I wanna, do... I want to oh, hear about yeah. your migration to television, because you did, you were oh. usually successful, continue to be in films, but then now there's this whole new opportunity in television, and you've been at the cutting edge of that as well for a long time. Okay, well, th thank, thank you, thanks, Ted. So, um, well, the brief story on that is, because I started in television with Deanne Barkley, and I started, I produced two movies for TV at 25 years old. One was called Zuma Beach. It was the day in the Ooh, life remember, of I Zuma Beach. Movie. You know I totally it? remember this movie. <laughs> Crazy, okay. Suzanne Summers. Right? It, yeah, yeah. it was starred Suzanne Summers. Who, it was just like this. I have a lot of useless like, information in my head. <laughs> wow, but that's, that's, yeah. a, that's amazing. Yeah. So it was, 24 hours a day in the life of, the, of Zuma Beach. It was kind of like doing American yeah. Graffiti at the beach. Suzanne Summers, the biggest TV star at the time, woman. And um, it was, and it did, got great ratings. And then I immediately kicked off this other idea of doing a 20 hour miniseries on the Ten Commandments, where each commandment was an underlying theme in a contemporary moral dilemma. And I did several of those and then I couldn't stand working for, for this with my boss at the time, and I um, had to leave. <laughs> but, um, and so I never finished the whole, com the whole series of commandments. But um, <laughs> how many commandments did you get to? <laughs> well, I got to three. <laughs> um, those are the good ones. Yeah, those yeah. were the good ones. And I, I haven't violated those yet. Uh, so um, in any event, so I started doing television, but I felt like I didn't do any, I, di I didn't feel like I really succeeded in the way I wanted to. And then I, I was able to, you know, write and produce Splash that did really well. And I thought, because this did well, it afforded me the luxury of doing something that I really wanted to do, was, which was do television and do it on a high, on just on a, on a high quality, you know, high yeah. quality without any goal in mind. My only goal was to have it be good, have the auspices be good. So the first two shows, one was with Aaron Sorkin called Sports Night, which was a while ago, and the other ones with J.J. Abrams called Felicity. And, yeah. and they weren't huge hits, but they were, I think they were good. They staying and power too. They were staying, yeah. and, so, and so then that just, you know, I, I stayed very, very excited about doing television, once again, with no real goal in mind, and other, I mean, other than just to try to do good stuff. And then I was able to do 24, which was kind of groundbreaking in the time because it was like a serialized yeah. show. And, um, and um, that, by the way, wasn't very successful at first. In fact, the first two years were not successful, but they were so cool to keep it on. We, I was begging them constantly, lobbying them, please, and yeah, yeah. so was everybody else. But they kept it on and it became very successful. And now we have a new 24 after its nine years that is gonna, that is gonna debut right after the Super Bowl um, this coming year. And then I have Can Empire, you? yeah. Do you think... Um, but I, lo I love television. Of course, we did Arrested Development Arrested and Development. even did it for you. Yeah. Tell me about that was a fast yes too. That was that great. was a fast yeah. yes. I was that was I, we were we were making Arrested Development. We had to figure out yeah. everyone uh, the details would fall into place oh, later. Yeah. Um, can we? Um, do you think in this world where there's now so much television being produced and still about the same number of films being produced every year that in that opportunity uh, that we can become more diverse, more women producers, writers, directors, particularly? Uh, do you think that's happening, or you think it's going to happen? Or I think it is happening. 
And then I'm going to switch to you because, I mean, you're a very good case study, case yeah. example of how it is, in fact, happening. But I definitely think it's happening. When I started the, the year after Splash, actually in 1985, I produced a movie called Real Genius. There were no women directors. But I was able to hire one named Martha Coolidge yeah, who did this movie. Yeah. You know every yeah. movie. It's crazy. <laughs> you are. You're a movie <laughs> savant. So... Um, but now I think there's many, many more, and I, I know what I, I, I um, you know, like I said, we, the, sh the woman that runs our show, uh, Empire, and also Franzi Calvo, they're both women, and they understand the female perspective really well, and it's, it's gigantically power, it's a gigantically powerful force to have them on. But what are you doing? You're doing a lot with <laughs> women executives and yeah. women... As artists, as either running shows or directing shows. Yeah, and I think, I mean, maybe it starts with, because I've, I've filled our executive suite with women. I mean, we have I, Cindy Holland, who runs our original series. Yeah. I mean, I, I get, it's shorthand to give me a, a lot of credit for what happens at Netflix, because it's easier to write about one name or one person. <laughs> but man, it's, a, it's a, an amazing team. And Cindy is the, one of the most, power, if, if not the most powerful person in television right now. Probably, in terms yeah. of her ability to her green light authority uh, is we. I always tell her she, my team has more buying power than anyone has selling power, so <laughs> it makes the negotiations a little lopsided sometimes. Uh, but they make great decisions, and I think um, we just Bella Bajaria, who just joined our, our company, she was the president oh, of television yeah. at Universal. Um, we have a, I mean, a, a, a team of very powerful female executives uh, working with me and for me, and that I just. I think it's why they make yeah. such great choices, great creative choices. Yeah. I think they, um, they and, and because of that, because it starts there, uh -huh. um, you see things like um, Melissa Rosenberg, who is the showrunner on uh, Jessica Jones. Um, she wanted to make sure we were hiring a lot of women directors. She kept running into, between us and Marvel and ABC TV, uh, you had to kind of navigate the, the waters to get what you really wanted. And she came up with a very inventive idea which was that season two, every episode would be directed by a woman. And wow. uh, Ali Goss, who It's works like a our, movement, actually. Yeah, That's and, cool. Uh, Ali Goss in our office um, supported her all the way and pushed this thing through. And we were doing it. Next season, every episode is going to be directed by a female. Wow, nice. Um, um, not, not on Netflix, but um, Ava DuVernay, who just directed the 13th for Netflix, who's a great director. Who's, this, if you have not seen 13th yet, please watch it. It's a very important doc. Uh, and she's an amazing filmmaker. And uh, the show that she does uh, for OWN, um, all female directors. So mm -hmm. I think it's like, you have to have, I think it starts with uh, a, a female executive who will empower the female storyteller to hire the female directors. And that it just starts, right, right now, 17% of television episodes are directed by women. Seven, wow. And that's up, but that's up from 16% last year. Right. So it's a movement, but it's this big right now. Yeah. But I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna explode. Keep I think, going. Me and too. I, I just, and I find that um, uh, the, the shows run well. They are uh, on, on House of Cards. Some of the best episodes of House of Cards are directed by Robin Wright. She is a and, really? and her, absolutely. Wow, I didn't even her, know that. Her direction on those shows and the way that she works with the crews. And the way that she works with the other, with the cast and the writers, it's phenomenal to watch. And her epi and her acting in every episode that she directs is better. Uh -huh. Like she's uh -huh. just phenomenal in that way. Jodie Foster, who you yeah. has directed episodes of House of Cards for us, has directed episodes of Orange Is the New Black for us. So we are working as hard as we can, as often as we can, to make sure that the television's very diverse in front of and behind the camera. Wow, so. amazing! Great job, yeah. awesome! Yeah. It's amazing. amazing. <laughs> and we both had success with. Women executives, for, for sure. For sure, since Who, the where's your success stories? Well, I mean, I start. Uh, actually, someone. Her name is Karen Kahila Sherwood. She was our, um, when we were very small. She thirty years ago. She was our UCLA intern, and she stayed with me for twenty eight years, and ended up running our company. <laughs> wow. And Erica Huggins has been with me a long time, yeah. and it's just. A lot of them, I just find that women's egos are different than men's egos. It's, and that, and what happened is, I had this moment, there were a couple of moments in time where I had movie, big movies, even like, like The Grinch That Stole Christmas, you know? And it, I remember it was, I thought, this is gonna really do well. It was, had to be in the Christmas time, Christmas time zone, of course, because it's called The Grinch That Stole Christmas. And another studio, we already picked a date, and another studio, put their movie on our date. And so 
the chairman of, the, my, of, the, of my studio said, said, screw them, you know, like, fuck them or something. <laughs> um, I'm going like, what do you mean fuck them? They have a bigger movie with more bigger movie stars. Let's just move. And he, and he you know, and so men, they get very testosterone crazy. Whereas I always feel like women, they certainly have egos, but it's, they, I think they're thought to be more emotional, but I find them weirdly in decision making less emotional and more objective. And, and they're much more capable to model reality yeah. than men. And whereas men get like crazy, you know, I'll screw that guy over, okay. And then they start using those metaphors, like, I'll, you know, like fighting metaphors, or I'll throw food at her metaphors. It's just like, anyway, so I've sort of studied it a little bit because of different, different trigger points in my career. But how about on your well, side? Well, before I, yeah. oh, before sorry, we, I, I want to open for Q&A, but before we yeah, do one course, last quick story, because yes. in this week's okay. uh, Hollywood Reporter, there's a great profile on Lisa Nishimura, who's our VP of documentaries okay. and stand-up comedy. And she is really a, a genius. And let me tell you why. So first of all, she's, she, she runs all of our documentary business, including 13, 13th and uh, Audrey and Daisy that we just talked about. So uh, under Lisa's direction, she's had four Oscar nominations for Best Documentary Features in three years. Wow. Uh, one every year for three years and two last year. Um, the, the short list has just come out. She's got four movies on the short list. And it's her, she has impeccable taste. She manages relationships like nothing you've ever seen before. And she nurtures talent to be their best uh, over wow. and over and over again. And I wanted to tell the story real quick about um, what happened to Miss Simone. That okay. was uh, the, the, um, Liz Garbus directed this amazing film about uh, and, uh, Nina Simone. And she brought it into me the first time. And she said, I want to make this movie. And this is... Um, very beginning of our original documentary f phase. And I've, I've always had this hard rule that million dollar documentaries don't really work. Um, you, you're sure to lose money. If you look at the model, how they get watched, how they show. So, but it was always grounded in the old business model where you had to sell movie tickets and DVDs to make your money mm -hmm. back. And in this case, the budget, budget was, was much more than that. And, it, and it's a music doc, which you know, we didn't have a lot of great experience with. And Lisa came in with a pitch and I said, my own conventional wisdom, we're not gonna do that. And she's like, look, I, I really think this is something special. You should really think about it more. And she kept coming. And what you said about being to talk, it's, it's, she's persistent. Yeah. She came in almost every day and told me why we were making a bad call. And I finally, I just said, you know what, Lisa, you, I don't know why we're even having this conversation. You own this decision anyway. So as long as you're willing to live with the outcome, go make your movie. Wow. And she and, and, she and Liz, and then they went out and made this incredible film about Nina Simone that was so much more than a music doc. That it was and was hugely successful in every way you'd measure, and that's just one of. Right now, she has 65 documentary projects in, in different forms of production right now, wow. and she's just a really incredible executive. And I just find that when you you're subsidizing people, the you entire let them run. movie industry, <laughs> <laughs> but if you give people power and let yes. them run with it, and just make sure they know they're accountable, yeah. and that, I find that so much more efficient than saying, "Here's the rules. Stay within these rules and go off and do right. your thing." Because they're going to do better work, right? Way better work. They, and they're going to feel better about they're they dealing own the with win. their own conscience. Right. Their own, right. Well, yeah. And it would, but it would take that kind of, I think, different ego, I think, to be able to do that. Yes. And, and I've had other, you know, we've had other experiences through the years that have just been phenomenal like that, but I think that crystallizes the best. Yeah. So let's open it up because we have some more time. And we have two microphones over here, please. We have a few minutes. We'd love to have some uh, QA. So just profound don't be shy. Questions. Just deep, <laughs> deep, profound questions. <laughs> no question. Wait, oh, we have a go. question. You can just yell it out if you don't go to the microphone. I just have an observation. Can they be a question? I can't let go those two dead birds. Okay. <laughs> it's too good. Okay. It's too good. Yeah. Do you think if a woman was pitching those two dead birds would not have been considered a bad woman? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Ted, this one's for you. <laughs> I, I just don't know. I, I couldn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Well, any other questions? <laughs> right here. Okay, Suzanne. Suzanne Todd. Hi. Hi, um, Hi Suzanne. Uh, thank you both for being here tonight. I think You're it's welcome. pretty incredible for all of us. 
I'm curious, both of you, so, um, you know, continuing to be at the top of your game for years and decades and decades now, professionally, like, what's ahead for both of you that's still a goal or something you haven't done or something you're looking forward to accomplishing? Mm. Or is there just nothing left? <laughs> uh, we got, I have a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah. So we, we just started our, um, doing a, a large scale original films for Netflix that are um, trying to be the, like the kind of movies you'd see on Friday night at the theater, but it's, they're on Netflix. Um, big budget films with we're doing Will Smith, Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie just directed this beautiful movie for us uh, called for, um, First They Killed My Father. Uh, which sounds like a super happy movie, but it's not. Um, um, <laughs> but so we're, I think we've got a lot of work to do in the original film space yet that really keeps me excited every day. And, and we're um, only this year in January it's launched in 130 additional countries. So now Netflix is in 190 countries. And we're doing local language original series in Brazil, Mexico, Japan, Korea, uh, India. So it's a weird, and you speak all those different. languages. Yes, of course, <laughs> fluently. fluently. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, uh, sure. Uh, I'm Candice Lindsay. I can't. Um, okay. I had a question. How do you go about licensing licensing music for your shows? Is it a specific person that uh, you speak with, or is it different directors? It's usually the producers who are producing the shows that, that, will, that will run the music licensing, and we support them internally um, with, with, the, with the legal work behind it, but that the producers will do it, set about to do that in the, on the shows. Is it a thought of, is there more women licensing the music or men licensing the music? Is that? You, um, I don't, you know, I don't know that there's a real imbalance or imbalance Probably more, in that. Well, Probably from my women. experience, yeah, there you go. Let's go with That's that. That's true, right? <laughs> is that not true? I thought I, it's close. It's yeah. kind of My, because I get, again there's I, a lot I, I of mu a lot of music supervisors are women. Yeah. The lace the the person that actually is sort of that's negotiating the licensing itself. I've experienced there are more men that are much older. I was thinking music older guys. Too, yeah. I think you were. Th that's what yeah. I thought. Yeah. But like our, our legal team is probably seventy percent female. So I think that they tend to work with. Females more, so I, so I see It's kind of an old experience. system, but the music supervisors, with which Ted and I were just responding to, yeah. a lot of them are women. They're, they're super state of the art. They're really good at it. But the, the other thing is kind of a, is a sort of a medieval kind of a transactional or, or yeah. group of people. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. So when you program for India and Mexico and Brazil and these new markets for you, do you think that, do you ever think how will they translate here and do you have plans to import them here? Yeah. Will they be global or just for those particular individual countries? So we produce, did everyone hear the question? Um, so we produce them in local language with local talent, always with local producers, uh, and we, we release them globally at the same time. So we dub and subtitle in 24 languages today. Um, I imagine that'll be 80 languages over time. And we do find that, uh, like we produce a series in France called Marseille, uh, that people really love in France and all over Europe. And uh, Gerard Depardieu is a huge star all over Europe, particularly huge. Uh, <laughs> you said that. Um, and but the show gets, but we have a, a huge audience for it in the U.S., uh, where we already know we have a big audience for French language television. So with that, we can produce on a larger scale in France because we know that millions of people are going to watch Marseille outside of France. But, I, but those shows have to really work in that country. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, I cut you off. With witnesses, the women, they tell me, you know, witnesses yeah. that, because um, that was so singularly international, too, in, in appeal for, you know, Western audiences. I was, you know, I, I hope you do more of that. Yeah, uh, I like the idea, the, those local language, the local originals that we produce, they're, they're really geared to be successful in the local territory. Really great if it can be pan regional and even a, a huge home run when they could be global. So, yeah. Sure. Hi. Sorry, just for the college girls, the kind of the high school ones, um, where we don't have such a solid um, network and foundation, we're just freshly out of college. Like, what is it that you look for um, when hiring, you know, as a, a fresh, just fresh out of college? <laughs> Well, I look for people that have an original voice. Uh, whatever the, it doesn't have to be a writer, I mean, just an executive. Anyone that 
actually has an original thought. <laughs> Stands out. Anything that, dip, and by the way, I mean, I, I, I'm attracted to people that are, actually, Ted and I were saying something that's, it's a bit of a digression. We both said we like people that make us laugh. But there's nothing wrong with that, actually. In other words, if you, if you have, if, um, I'm very attracted to people that have an original voice, that find ways to differentiate themselves, having had through either through experience or through some way that expanded their psyche or emotionality. Anything that's refreshing, any kind of a new insight will turn me on. Um, and I like in a meeting where I'm surprised. Uh, and there's two ways to be surprised. One is an actual surprise. <laughs> and the other is when somebody researches you. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. And the other is when someone actually has researched you well enough and they say to you, they give you a gift of something, a piece of knowledge that, that, that you would want to know. So, and, and, there, and that's a very easy thing to do. So you just research to someone, does Brian Grazer like music? What kind of, whatever that thing is, then you come in with the gift of a piece of music that is something that's new or fresh or different or something from a different culture that turns you on. It could be you know, something from Western Africa, Senegalese. It can be just something that differentiates you um, and a gift in some ways. Yeah, and for us, you, Ted. you know, it's funny, we're, we're rooted as a tech company, even though we're a big entertainment company now, and so we don't do some of the entertainment company things like have internships, and it's not, I, I, we have some people inside of, inside of Netflix who come in um, in kind of admin roles um, and then work their way up through the company. It's very unusual to come in right out of college and get a job at Netflix doing a lot of jobs. I mean, it's just, it's, we tend to look for people who've done it before somewhere, somewhere. Um, and then, and, and to Brian's point, what I'm always interviewing for is curiosity. Hmm. Um, I, I found the, the, one, the worst interviews that I have is when we, we, I don't know if you're familiar, but we have this thing called the Netflix Culture Deck. It's oh, about yeah. a 150 page PowerPoint doc <coughs> that Sheryl Sandberg said is the most important document in the history of the internet, that kind of thing. Wow. And then people come in to interview for us and it really basically says, here's who we are, <laughs> here's how we do things. Yeah. And then they go, I never heard of that. And so, <laughs> yeah. so I always like that be, work. doing that research, going in, don't go in flat footed, really had, know, know that I, let, it, let me know that you at least Googled the company yeah. and figured some of those things out. <laughs> so, that kind of exactly. Stuff. Yeah. Avoid generic questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, are we done or we got yeah, one more. right there? Oh, one more. Yes. We have time for one more? Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Eleuthera, and I, my question is, in light of the election, and forgive me, I'm going to politicize the question ever so slightly. <laughs> we got this far. We got this whole time without <laughs> yeah. So in light of the election, considering that arguably media has had a greater influence on our culture maybe than ever before, we have a real, real, reality television star elected president. Um, I'm just curious to hear from you gentlemen what it is that Hollywood and your pathos and your feeling about a response to that. If media has this much influence, enough to shape our culture, enough to drive our government, is anything going to change? Is there a new conversation? Just, just sort of curious from your perspective. This is all yours, Ted. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to you first. <laughs> I think it is. I really do. <laughs> I, th I honestly, I, the, the only thing I can say about the results of the election is it was, it's, it, it was probably eye-opening to the world, eye-opening to, uh, and, and hopefully what it says is we've not been listening, we've not been paying attention to half the country for too long. And let's, let's open this up and let's have the, be open to the possibility that there's a lot of people who don't think exactly like you do. And what are you doing about that? And, and it's, it's, I think sometimes you need that jolt and that wake-up call and this election was certainly that. Okay. Here we are. Brian and Ted, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, My goodness. Oh, thank you. All right, buddy. Thank you. And you are the inaugural guest to vision, male guest to Visionary Women. And not only did we learn something, 
not only how I think we all can say honestly we are inspired by knowing that there's people like you running a media business and thinking about women and understanding that women are different from men. And also, it was a lot of fun. Thank you very, very much.